Hello, and thank you for joining us uh, for today's program. Today's program, Fall Pest Prevention, is sponsored by the Contra Costa County Library and Our Water, Our World. In just a moment, I'm going to uh, let Our Water, Our World representatives Suzanne and Charlotte take over. But before then, I do have a few words um, about the library's resources. And I'm just going to share a screen. Sorry. And it won't load. <laughs> of course not. The Contra Costa County Library is happy to connect you with our resources, services, and materials at all 26 of our branches. Access more than 1 million physical items, including international language collections, and thousands of digital materials 24-7 at cccLib.org. Visit any library to use our public computers, printers, and free Wi-Fi. You can also visit one of our branches with laptops for on-site use or check out a Wi-Fi hotspot for three weeks. The Contra Costa County Library's Adult Literacy Program trains and supports volunteer tutors to deliver basic literacy instruction to adults throughout the county. Visit our website and sign up for a digital library card today. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Charlotte. Thank you so much for being here, Charlotte. Thanks for having us. I, one sec, having a little, okay, there we go. Share my screen. All right, all good? You can see my screen? <laughs> Excellent. All right, thank you for being here today. Today we're gonna to talk about fall pest prevention. Uh, my name is Charlotte Canner. I'm gonna start us off today and then Suzanne Von Tempo will be joining us in a moment. There she is. <laughs> so today we're going to talk about, um, I'll start us off talking about the Our Water, Our World program, integrated pest management, uh, how we approach pest management, and then we will dive into some specific fall pests um, that we see a lot of and we know people struggle with. And of course, we will take your questions at the end as well. So we'll go through slides for about an hour, maybe a little bit less, and then we'll take questions at the end. We're brought to you today by the Contra Costa Clean Water Program, which works to protect Contra Costa County creeks, wetlands, bay, and the ocean from runoff that may carry pollutants into the waterways. Uh, related to gardening, that means um, avoiding chemicals that can be washed off the lawn and garden and into storm drains by irrigation and rain. And we'll talk also that it doesn't, it's not always gardening. We're going to talk indoor pests as well, which also have an effect on our waterways. So first, what is the Our Water, Our World program? Um, it's an award-winning program that is designed to bring awareness between the um, between water quality and pesticide use. Um, and it is a partnership with retailers and water agencies throughout the state of California. Uh, we provide pest problem solving education to the public, uh, like webinars like this, or you'll see us in the stores doing classes and um, social media and just trying to get our education out there. If you go to a store that we partner with, a hardware store or garden center in Contra Costa, which there are about 35 stores or so, give or take, in Contra Costa that partner with us, you might see uh, these blue tags on the shelves that highlight the less toxic, eco-friendly products. And you might see a QR code poster or a fact sheet rack in the store with handouts with free helpful information um, for customers to read about pests and other gardening issues. So before we dive in, I apologize. I think my computer has a life of its own and it always does this. One slide will always give me a problem. Okay, hopefully it'll stay there. Sorry about that. Um, we're going to talk about <laughs> um, urban runoff because uh, what we want to share is that everything we do in our gardens or out in the world uh, does have a direct line to waterways, um, including gardening, but also walking our dog, washing our car. Um, the water that goes down the drain at the street level, at the storm drain, uh, does go straight to a waterway without filtration in between. So again, everything we're doing out in the world has a direct line to waterways through those storm drains.
Um, now in the home, pesticides travel through the sewer system to a wastewater treatment facility. So it's not a direct line. They are, they do go to the wastewater treatment facility first, um, but pesticides are not removed at the um, wastewater treatment facility. Treatment facilities are designed to pull out bacteria, solid waste, pathogens, but not um, certain chemicals like pesticides. So again, pesticides can enter the home, enter the waterway through our homes as well, not just on the street. So how we avoid getting pesticides into our waterways is by using integrated pest management. Um, and now integrated pest management is a kind of a big picture, holistic view of pest management with long aiming at long-term solutions, not just quick fixes. And we use science-based information. So we, re we reference a lot of the University of California and other university information. And then we take steps that we will go into um, we, of course, identify, prevent, but then when we do have a problem, we're going to take some action steps called controls, which we will review, cultural controls, bolstering the health of the garden and the home, mechanical controls, which are physical things that we can use, biological controls, which are our garden allies and our other organisms that can help us with pest management, and lastly, as a last resort, always chemical controls. So let's review our IPM controls in depth. Um, so we're gonna talk about cultural controls. So cultural controls are increasing the health of the environment, whether that's your garden or your home, you're creating a really good environment for yourself, your plants, uh, your the structure of your home, and you're making it a less desirable environment for pests. Pests, you know, like, you know, unsanitary conditions and they like stressed out plants that are not getting their needs met. So if we do the opposite, get make sure our garden and our home are the opposite, what pests don't like, we will be automatically reducing pests. So in the home, we're gonna seal up cracks and crevices. We're gonna fix leaky pipes because a lot of pests come in for water. We're gonna keep our food containers pest proof. Um, and that can look different depending on what pest we're managing. Foundation, we wanna keep the, the foundation and the home clear of debris that can help with a lot of different pests and uh, including like you know mold and rodents and uh, insects as well. And of course, plant materials also away from structures which will reduce pest problems, but also reduce fire risk. In our garden, we're gonna start with the soil, build healthy soil and feed with organic fertilizers that will build a healthy plant structure. We're gonna protect our soil with mulch. We're gonna choose the right plants for our, uh, our yard, our garden. Our gardens are our own ecosystem, so we're gonna choose the right plants. We're gonna rotate annual food crops to reduce pests in the soil and also circulate nutrients. We're always watering deeply. Um, and less often as plants grow and also focus on garden maintenance. Now we talked a little bit more about each of these things in our last program, which was fall is for planting last month. So you can, if you wanna learn more, you can go back to that one. So we're gonna focus on plant selection to reduce pests. Uh, this is just one of the many things, one of the many cultural controls that we can focus on. But, uh, you know, do your homework, look at your yard, understand your yard, you know, the conditions throughout the year, they might change throughout the year, how much sun, how much wind, what's your soil texture, and try to find plants that match those conditions because when you match the conditions, the plants match the conditions of your garden, they're gonna be happier, they're gonna get their needs met, they're gonna be less stressed and less attractive to pests. That's the big idea, stressed out plants attract pests, so we wanna reduce plant stress. We're gonna understand the mature size of the plant that we're buying. When we buy them, there can be only like this size sometimes, but how big is it gonna be? Those um, tags that come in the plants will tell you how much water, how much sun, um, and how big it's gonna get. So make sure we're matching the mature size of the plant to the space available, because if we stick something in a place that's too small for it, it's going to be constantly stressed. It's not gonna have enough space to spread out and get as big as it wants to be. 
Um, and through that, we're going to avoid overcrowding. We're going to group plants by the need, their needs. So the low water use plants are going to go together. The higher water use plants like our veggies are going to go together um, and we're going to keep them separate. Uh, we're going to plant correctly, which um, you know means not too deep, not too high, um, and we're going to water correctly, which would be watering at the the uh, root zone, not at the base of the plant. We're going to use water to expand and grow a healthy root zone. And then we're going to perform healthy garden maintenance. Uh, right now, you know, fall there. You know, most of our summer food crops are done. So we're gonna pick those up, get those out of the yard. We're gonna harvest our fruit and any nuts on our trees that are still there. We're gonna pick them off off the ground, uh, really clean up the garden um, and, uh, you know, prune out. If you see some fungal spores, we're gonna prune out some diseased uh, and damaged leaves, any limbs. We're not gonna do a heavy pruning right now for most things, but we might wanna look at our trees and see if there's any limbs that are going to potentially cause more problems if there was like a big uh, storm. Uh, we wanna you know, make sure we're not causing damage by leaving limbs on there. So we might do some light pruning just to reduce damage. And then we're gonna be out monitoring for problems. Um, and I, I do, you know, we do want to have a nice clean garden when it comes to our fruit and our disease, um, our disease plant material, but we also don't want a super clean garden. We do want to keep, uh, you know, some leaves on the ground. Uh, we want to have mulch on the ground. We want to make sure there's still habitat for a lot of insects, the good insects to overwinter um, so that they can be around next spring when the pests, when other spring pests come back. And then uh, we're going to move on to mechanical control. So these are tools uh, and barriers that we can, physical things that we can use to keep pests away from our homes or our plants. So these are some tools that we can use in the home to keep pests out. This is the best, so the best way and most effective way to keep pests out of your home or is exclusion, physical barriers. There's no, you know, magical spray that's going to keep every pest out all the time. It's always going to be physical exclusion is the best way to keep pests out of your home. So um, the hardware cloth, quarter inch hardware cloth for keeping rodents out, door sweeps can keep rodents and cockroaches and spiders out, caulking and weather stripping, keep those crawling insects out. Sheet metal corners on your um, garage doors can keep rodents out if they've gnawed away the corner. And then of course, window and door screens will keep our flying insects out as well. And then in the garden, there's also lots of barriers we can use, netting, fencing, row cover, um, copper barrier tape can deter some snails and slugs. And then of course, if we're planting new plants in the ground, we always want to use gopher baskets to protect plant roots in the ground. Prevention with gopher baskets is definitely the best way to keep your plants safe from gophers. And then there's more, there's exclusion frames, fencing and baskets that we can use to keep rodents, birds, raccoons, squirrels out of our gardens, especially our veggie gardens. Um, I Again, physical barriers, especially for rodents, physical exclusion frames, is going to be really the only way we are going to keep our um, rodents out of our veggie gardens because uh, they'll they'll go past any smelly repellent that we spray if there's a nice juicy tomato on the vine. So um, consider these physical barriers. They don't have to be quite as you know built up and you know fancy like the middle exclusion frame, but it is very beautiful. So maybe we want to do that if we we can. Um, if we're keeping out rodents, we're going to use quarter inch hardware cloth. If we're doing gopher baskets or lining our raised beds to keep gophers out, we can use half inch hardware cloth. To keep squirrels away, we can use three quarter inch fencing or poultry wire. And then if we have deer issues, we want to have at least seven feet tall uh, fencing or taller. And it depends if you're on a slope, you're going to have to um, make it even taller. 
And then some more physical barrier, physical tools that we can use are traps. Um, and there's traps for lots of different kinds of pests. Um, the sticky insect traps can be used to monitor to see if you do have those pests in the area. And then of course they do kill some of them. Uh, the fly sticks, um, you know, window fly traps, those are sticky flying insect traps. Yellow jacket traps, really effective to keep our yellow jacket population down. And we'll talk about, about preventing yellow jackets later on in the program. Uh, snail traps, and then of course, different kinds of rodent gopher mole traps as well. Then we're gonna move on to our biological controls. Uh, these are using garden allies and other um, organisms like bugs, birds, um, you know, hawks, coyotes, <laughs> to keep our pest problems down. Mostly we're focusing on the bugs, the insects. So, um, you know, aphids, scale, white fly um, are, are eaten by many different kinds of bugs, eat those pest insects. So we want to encourage those in the garden. Uh, green lace wings, lady beetles, soldier beetles are just three of many good bugs in the garden. Um, I would say most, like 90% of the bugs in the garden are good bugs. So definitely make sure that we know what we're looking at before we squish or spray because it's a good chance it's a garden ally and it's gonna help us with any other pest insects. So to invite in those good bugs, uh, we are going to plant diversity, different kinds of flowers, different shaped flowers, especially those daisies or coreopsis, the ones with the round middle and the petals around, or the yarrow, that yellow plant you see in the picture, the clusters of small flowers. Both of those types of flowers, those shapes, can invite in those good bugs, but generally more diversity of plants, the better, and of course reducing our pesticide usage, including eco-friendly, so that will always, that will help our biological controls. Oh, here we go again. I apologize. Let's see if this works. Okay, thank you. There we go. Um, chemical controls is our last control in IPM, and we um, are always going to use these as a last resort. And before we reach for a spray, we want to understand that pesticides don't solve the pest problem. They are a short-term solution. They will kill pests, um, but they're not going to solve the problem. If your plants are stressed out, um, you're going to have keep having pest problems um, and you are not going to solve it just with a pesticide. We're also going to remember that some pests are seasonal and expected so we can be prepared for them and not worry too much if they do arrive because we know that they're going to come. We're gonna understand that pests are food for beneficial bugs, like in this wonderful picture, those are some yellow aphids on a plant, but that critter up in the corner is a lady beetle larva. Um, so that's what they first look like when they're born. Um, so they eat lots of aphids. So we wanna make sure that we have pests. <laughs> well, we don't wanna make sure, but if we do have pests, we wanna remember that they are food for these other creatures. So we want to reevaluate um, our thresholds. You know, some aphids in the garden are good uh, and they can be, that population will feed ladybugs and will keep the ladybugs around. And again, an infestation of a pest. So if it's really bad, if it's not just a small amount of aphids, it's a ton of aphids all the time, that can be a clue that something is not working or that the plant is stressed. And so again, we need to go back and figure out, is it the watering? Is it the fertilizing? Is it the container or space that it's in? Is it getting enough sun? Why is this plant having such problems? And when we use pesticides, we're always going to use them as a last resort. We're gonna choose the less toxic, most eco-friendly option. We're going to apply according to the label. The label is very important. We're always gonna wear our protective equipment, our personal protective equipment, eye covering, mouth covering, nose, uh, long sleeves, long pants, closed toed shoes, always recommended even with an eco-friendly product. And we're gonna understand the risks of that pesticide. 
So we, when we are buying, we're going to read the label. It's going to tell us, well, it might not tell us the mode of action, but we can understand the mode of action based on the active ingredient. So is it a contact kill? Does it need to be eaten by the pest? How does this product work? Um, understand that sometimes less toxic products may take longer to work. That doesn't mean they're less good. It just means that that's how they work. Bait stations, for example, we'll talk about ant baits in a moment. Uh, they are very effective, but they might take a few days. So uh, understand and give it a little bit of time. Timing is important. You know, not all pesticides work on all pests at their their entire life cycle. Sometimes they don't eat when they're adults and it will only work when they're in their larval stage. So understand what your pest is and what time of its life cycle it's at. We're only gonna spot treat. So we're only targeting just the pest. We're spraying where the pest is, when the pest is present. Um, many of the modes of, many times the mode of action is a contact kill. So it, the pest needs to be there for us to spray it. Um, if we're just spraying the, the product around on the plant, it's not getting where it needs to be. And it's gonna be a waste of money and potentially harmful for the environment. If we do spray pesticides, we're going to spray at dusk. That is when the beneficial insects are less active and it gives time overnight for the product to be active and uh, wet on the plant and it will dry by the morning time when the beneficials come back out. Also, sometimes um, pesticides on a plant can, in, the, in sunlight, can burn the plant or they can become ineffective in sunlight. So again, Spraying at dusk is gonna be better for many reasons. If we do choose to release beneficials like ladybugs into the garden, we're gonna give them time to work and find the pests that could be anywhere from a couple of days to a couple of weeks uh, before we reach for a pesticide because we don't want to harm those beneficials that we released. And again, understand the unintended consequences. Even eco-friendly products can harm good bugs, they can harm ourselves, they can harm pets. Uh, so we really wanna be careful when we are um, applying a pesticide. We know all the risks, read that label and protect ourselves, our family, our pets and the environment. And just last thing before we move on to specific pests, we wanna uh, just another, you know, more understanding that we have when we're dealing with pests, the better. So proper identification is really step one in IPM. We need to understand what we're targeting um, before we do any kind of uh, action steps. And remember that a lot of pests or good bugs and pests look very similar. So we're gonna show you a couple of examples and then also different problems look very similar as well, but they're very different. So we want to identify the pests, understand the life cycle, the pest habitat and timing. We know, you know, certain pests like certain plants and they, you know, will be there in late summer. So we're going to be prepared for them and we can understand how to reduce their damage. And then what are their natural enemies and are they in the garden? Um, this is just a picture of a caterpillar. It's a it's actually not a caterpillar. It's a surfed fly larva and not a caterpillar. It is a like a maggot, I guess. Um, and they love to eat aphids and other small insects and they're common and you can th find them on roses that have these pests on them. So again, this is not a caterpillar eating a rose leaf. It is a surfed fly larva eating pest insects. Another example, these two pictures show curling leaves. Some have redness on them or both kind of have reddish tinge to them, but they are very different pests. This is the top damage is caused by aphids. When aphids suck juices out of the leaves, the leaves tend to curl. And then this bottom one is peach leaf curl, which is a fungal disease. So one's an insect and one's a fungal disease. And we would treat those very differently. One we'd use an insecticide and one we would use a fungicide. Here's another example. These pictures were sent from someone who actually attended one of our programs. Uh, this was a, uh, a red leaf ornamental plum on the street. And he thought he had skill. He wanted to know what to spray and had all these like bumps on his tree. 
It turns out this is a ladybug pupa. Looks kind of like scale because it doesn't move and it has kind of that bump. And then this is soft scale. So actually we don't need to spray anything because once that ladybug pupa um, turns into an adult ladybug, it will go out and eat that soft scale. So actually those everything's working in this tree. The soft scale is there and the predator is gonna be there shortly. And with that, I'm gonna pass it to Suzanne to talk about specific fall pests. Thank you, Charlotte. Yeah, not easy to identify pest problems. So uh, I'm gonna walk us through an IPM approach for the common seasonal pests that we listed at the introduction. So ants, slugs and snails, yellow jackets, rats and mice, gophers and moles, raccoons, skunks and cats, dormant sprays, what they are and how to use them, and then peach leaf curl. So let's get started with ants. So many of us are seeing ants uh, coming into our homes right now. Um, I can share that they do have some benefits. It's hard to imagine, but outside ants are decomposers. They're also aerating the soil. So they're helping to keep that soil healthy. And they also are eating other pests. However, not always a benefit through, you know, our lens. And when we are trying to keep them out of the house, uh, also in the garden, when there is an excess of them, they are not going to be as helpful. So if we see ants marching up a trunk of a tree like that, uh, plum, that red leaf plum or a citrus or an abutilon, it is usually an indicator that something else is going on because they love the honeydew secretions that come from scale insects, uh, aphids, and other insects that are commonly found on some of our plants throughout the garden. They will protect those aphids and uh, keep the beneficials away. So in this picture, yes, those ants are fighting off the uh, lady beetles. So when we see them outside, they are an indicator that something else is going on. So we will want to manage those aphids or scale insects or whatever that pest might be. And outdoors, um, some solutions would be, as I just mentioned, managing the uh, pests that they are farming the honeydew from. We can also uh, create a sticky barrier with insect glue. This is something you can purchase. Um, it, it's also under the name of Tanglefoot or Tree Tanglefoot. It is very, very sticky. We will put it on a banding material such as packing tape with the sticky side out or um, soft cardboard or a very, very thick paper. Uh, anything that is not sticking to the bark, because we always want to be able to remove that sticky surface once it has gathered all of the ants or other insects that we're trying to prevent. Uh, we can also use outdoor ant bait stations. There are many on the market. Uh, Taro might be the one popular brand that we see most commonly. This is going to be a boric acid or a sodium tetraborate dihydrate uh, active ingredient which is mixed with a sugar attractant. So we, uh, they're on spikes, we put them around the house and according to the label, very effective to reduce those ant populations outside. Indoors, uh, so since many of us are seeing them indoors, maybe you can relate, we are going to clean, uh, remove those scouts. We see those little scouts coming in, hunting around, see if there's anything good for them, if they, if they wanna make their home in our home. So we're gonna clean those scouts up. We're going to clean up those scent trails those scouts have created. We are going to um, seal up any cracks or crevices with that fresh bead of caulk or similar. Uh, we are going to put that new weather stripping around the doors and windows, that door sweep, make sure it's all nice and tight and sealed so that we're keeping the warm winter or the warm air from our heaters in and those that cold air and those pests out. That's the idea. And then indoors, we do have, uh, we can recommend some ant bait stations. Uh, keep in mind, ant bait stations are little plastic trays and wet likes to chew on little plastic things, but pets and children. So we want to only target the pests, as Charlotte mentioned a couple slides before. And if that, if we do have pets and children in the house, we want to put those 
bait stations, maybe up on the counter where we see the ants, not at the on the floorboards where we see the ants. And there are eco-friendly sprays on the market, such as Zevo, Orange Guard, and there's others. However, keep in mind that um, a lot of the liquid pesticides are contact kills only. So they're only going to kill what's present. So working with a bait station might be more effective because they'll take that bait back to a colony, feed everybody. Uh, and then that population of ants will disappear. And then a couple of products that I like to talk about for indoor pest management is uh, boric acid. As we just mentioned, it's the active ingredient in those bait stations, the indoor and outdoor ant bait stations. Um, of course, we always want to read the label to make sure we are seeing that that is the active. Again, it might be listed as so sodium tetraborate tetrahydrate, uh, which is the boric acid. Um, it also comes in a powder. The powder is going to be uh, ideal for cockroaches and ants, whereas the bait stations are just designed for ants. Uh, this powder, this boric, pass, boric acid powder is about the size of a grain of salt. And what we're going to do is we're going to put a dusting of it in uh, maybe the frame of the wall or in cracks and crevices, like maybe where the wall and the floor meet or behind appliances or behind cabinets and so forth, uh, really out of reach of any pets or children. And what happens is, is ants and cockroaches are grooming insects. They walk over that boric acid and then they ingest it as they groom themselves. And it is uh, will disrupt their stomach uh, bacteria, preventing digestion, which will lead to starvation. As long as this boric acid stays dry, it will be effective for years to come. It's very inexpensive and very effective. Uh, the other product you might see commonly is called diatomaceous earth or DE. This is food grade. Food grade is sold in the, um, the aisle with the other pesticides. It is not the pool uh, for swimming pool diatomaceous earth, which is going to be with swimming pool equipment. That is not what we're talking about. This is the diatomaceous earth that is food grade. It is very fine, like chalk, uh, very, very fine powder. And what it happens is we will put it a dusting of it uh, again in those cracks and crevices, um, maybe a little border around the perimeter of our house, uh, behind cabinets, behind appliances, in the frame of walls, similar to that boric acid. And what happens, it kind of clings to insects like Velcro. It's like static electricity. It'll get on that exoskeleton of the insect and dehydrate it. So it's very effective as long as it stays dry. When it gets wet, it gets kind of mucky. It won't be as effective. And because it is such a fine dust, though it is completely non-toxic, it is going to be a lung and eye irritant. So we want to make sure that we're not breathing it, uh, we're not getting it in our eyes, and that we aren't having it in cracks and crevices where maybe a dog can come along and sniff and inhale it uh, and so forth. So those are some precautions to take for the diatomaceous earth. And so for slugs and snails, yes, now that we are getting some rains and we're getting cooler evening air temperatures, which means a little bit more condensation in the morning. So wetter gardens and the overnight hours, we are going to see more slugs and snails. Yikes. But there are some solutions. So we want to identify where their hiding places is. In my garden, the raised beds that we have actually have a lip on them so you can sit down and work. And I will share that those slugs and snails love to hide underneath the lip of that raised bed. So we want to hand remove them. Uh, it's always advised to wear gloves when we are touching the slugs and snails. Uh, so we're going to hand pick them and put them into a bucket of water uh, with a couple drops of dish detergent, or we can feed them to the chickens or ducks if we have those. Uh, snail boards are also really effective. These are actually fence boards that are attached to like a one by two. Uh, we put this near where they like to, uh, where their activity is, and they will hide under the snail board uh, when the daylight hours, that sun is high. They're kind of like vampires. They don't like to be in the sunlight. 
during the day, then we can lift up that board and scrape all those slugs and snails into that soapy bucket of water or feed to the chickens. It's kind of gross, but very satisfying. Uh, we can uh, use a copper barrier tape around our potted containers to prevent slugs and snails. Uh, they will not cross that copper because they'll get an electric shock. Um, and then we can also, in the open garden areas, uh, create a barrier with chunky wood mulch. When uh, we have chunky wood mulch around the garden, they have a difficult time crossing it. So it works very well as a barrier. Uh, if we are going to use a pesticide, there are lots on the market that are very effective. These iron phosphate baits, such as Sluggo, there are other brands. There's a brand by Bonide and also a brand um, by um, an iron phosphate bait by Garden Safe. So there are other brands out there that are packaging the same active ingredient. Just make sure you see that iron phosphate because that's the only active ingredient for slug and snail bait that is going to be safe uh, to use around pets and wildlife. However, if that dog gets into that bucket of sluggo or other iron phosphate bait, it's always advised to take them to the vet, though it's not going to be toxic to them. They could get a tummy ache or they could get um, an allergic reaction. Always best to be safe than sorry. And then yellow jackets, boy, uh, we sure came off a significant yellow jacket year. Uh, I know all of us were faced with yellow jackets and it seemed like all the stores were sold out of materials. So the trick here is to uh, understand that only the mated females overwinter as a queen. They look like a supersized yellow jacket. This is a yellow jacket that was under a patio umbrella at my house. I was opening it up and I noticed multiple queens under that umbrella uh, kind of freaked me out. So I stepped out uh, and then we just squished them. Very easy to do, but a little scary. Got to be brave. They will not wake up. However, as you could see, they look very large. Uh, in the late winter, early spring, such as March, when we have those, um, start to have a couple warm, sunny days in between those cold, late winter, early spring days, we will have yellow jackets emerge. They will break dormancy looking for a place to create a nest. If we have that yellow jacket trap out and ready to go in late February, early March, every queen we capture prevents thousands of yellow jackets from becoming established in that area. So that is the best management. Uh, if we do have an in-ground nest, understand we can reach out to our local vector control. Uh, you could just do an online search, local vector control for the county or city that you live in. And uh, they do have services where they will come and remove in-ground nests at no charge. You just have to flag the nest. All right, rodents. It seems like rodents in the garden are also a real common pest that we get a lot of questions about. So the trick here is to remove those places of harborage, all right? That ivy bank along the side of the house is their complete protected habitat. So if we really want to manage the rodents, we're going to have to remove that ivy. It might sound like a daunting task, but believe it or not, it could start with just weed whacking or getting that line trimmer to cut it back to its nubs. Then it's going to open up that area and make that area more exposed, which means now the rodents are exposed. And then guess what? Our raptors, such as those hawks, are going to come down and and feast on those rodents. So that's going to be step one. Next, we're going to uh, contain anything that they're getting into. So those compost stations, our chicken coops, our greenhouses, the uh, potting areas of our garden. If it is a potting station that we have starts, we're going to want to somehow contain it. Uh, so that means uh, sealing everything off with that quarter inch hardware cloth to prevent them from accessing and getting in to those the food that we're preventing them from getting into. We want to keep those lids on garbage cans and we want to uh, remove that pet food uh, from or limit the pet food accessibility. So some of us uh, feed our 
pets all day long. We allow our pets to graze. Uh, if we have rodents, it's actually just an open invitation to feed the rodents. Um, you could trust me as a pet owner. Um, our pets, they get hungry. They know when their feeding time is. So we want to train them to feed at our convenience. Okay. Cause this is also going to reduce those rodents. We are going to put the pet food. If we have it stored in the garage and just that paper bag, we're going to put that inside a galvanized can, like a small garbage can with a secure lid. We are going to rethink bird feeders because the bird feeders bill bird feed on the ground, which also attracts those rodents. Uh, whatever we do, we just want to remove the food sources or specifically re remove the access to those food sources. So exclusion is the key. We are going to prevent that access with barriers and exclusion frames. Um, when the rats and mice are coming in the house, uh, we're going to first try to identify what is that point of access? How are they getting in? Keeping in mind that mice and young rats can fit through three eighths of an inch of a hole. The hole does not have to be circular. It can actually be oblong or kind of like a triangle. It's typically a place that they've gnawed. So you're going to look for something like that. Um, then we're going to seal it up because until we've sealed their point of entry, we can't solve the problem. So cultural controls, uh, of course, we're going to put all food, such as that bag of dog food in the garage into a metal container that has a, a, a tight closing lid to prevent rodents from accessing it. Uh, we're gonna do the same with bird food um, and anything else they might be getting into. And then also in storage areas where we might store items in cardboard boxes, we wanna switch those out to plastic bins rather than cardboard because uh, rodents do like to nest in that cardboard. As long as there is no food or or anything of interest food-wise inside that plastic bin, we do not have to worry about rodents chewing into that plastic bin. Mechanical controls, we're going to re replace the weather stripping around the doors and the garages. Um, also that weather, uh, that door sweep. Um, we, if they have not at the door sweep and we don't want to replace again, that picture of that uh, sheet metal corner is an excellent inexpensive way. As long as it's firm up against the closed door uh, attached to the outside frame, it's going to be an excellent way to prevent rodents from gnawing on those door sweeps again. We're going to check the foundation and attic vents, to see if there's any access, if they've been able to get through and you know replace and back that vent with quarter inch hardware cloth. We're gonna do the same with the uh, fireplace vents, stove vents, laundry dryer vents. We're just gonna look everywhere and make sure they are unable to get in. We are also going to use that sheet metal roof flashing to cut around pipes where, you know, maybe the hot water heater uh, comes from inside to the outside pipe. Sometimes they chew around that or around the hose bib and we can cut that sheet metal roof flashing around to fit tight around the pipe to prevent them from chewing. And we are going to seal up any holes that might be under sinks or any walls anywhere with patch kits or that quarter inch hardware cloth with that uh, stucco or mortar over it or whatever we need to seal up the gap. And here's just a picture again of that quarter inch hardware cloth and then a roll of sheet metal roof flashing. With sheet metal roof flashing, you can cut with metal snips, uh, not super easy, but not also, also not very difficult. So understand that rats will chew through anything and everything except for these two galvanized products, the galvanized wire mesh uh, and the sheet metal roof flashing. And to manage rodents beyond that, uh, if we need to, we're uh, working with traps can sometimes be challenging. Uh, we Just because we have the trap and we've baited it doesn't mean we're going to have success. We want to understand that rodents are going to be suspicious of new things. And just because we put a little piece of peanut butter on there doesn't mean they're going to necessarily go for it. Uh, we're going to first bait those traps without setting them. If it's an electric trap, we're not going to put the batteries in it. We're just going to, you know, Hansel and Gretel, those little crumbs of bait 
into that tunnel of that electric trap or put, you know, uh, multiple crumbs or little bits around those, the wooden snap trap or the type of traps that kind of look like a jaws. Both of these are pictured here. And then uh, we're going to let those rodents get really used to feeding off of those traps before we set them. Um, types of bait we might want to use are little pieces of dog kibble or kitty kibble, little piece of a granola bar or like a cookie or Halloween candy. We're right, you know, Halloween's right around the corner. We could also use a little piece of a meat stick. Um, anything that we might have that they're already getting into as well, like that bird seed or that chicken feed. Um, then there is an outdoor trap that is, um, going to be very effective. Uh, pardon me. I do hear my dog barking. So one second. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> Um, the outdoor trap, which is the very popular, we see them at almost all the hardware stores, especially the Ace hardware stores. They are not inexpensive. They are run about a hundred dollars, not cheap. However, extremely effective. This is for outdoor use only. Um, and you can talk to those sales people at the hardware store, how they, uh, how to best use them, how to best place them, but they are very effective. I've had testimonials from many people. If we do have, uh, if we have captured a rodent indoors and with a, one of the traps that we use indoors, it is uh, advisable to remove the dead rodent immediately, put it in a bag that's sealed and put it into the garbage can so that we are not creating another problem. All right. Let's talk about an IPM approach for gophers and moles, keeping in mind that gophers might seem like they have, uh, they're getting the best of us, but they are, they are food for coyotes. So what Charlotte was mentioning before about coyotes being a, a garden ally. However, we don't always want to invite coyotes to our garden, right? So, uh, Proper identification is key. Uh, gopher activity is definitely ramping up because winter is right around the corner, uh, as has been mole activity. Okay. So keep in mind, gophers are going to be herbivores. They are only eating the root, roots of plants. Okay. And their tunnels are going to be much deeper, about six to 12 inches below the surface. Um, they have very extensive burrowing systems. So that's why they can be a little challenging to capture. Moles, on the other hand, I find them as being beneficial, believe it or not. They're eating uh, a lot of soil dwelling insects, such as white grubs and beetle larvae. So I have a different level of tolerance for them because I know they're paying me a service. However, they can do uh, quite a bit of damage to a turf area because they have shallow tunnels. Their uh, tunneling system is usually just below the surface of the soil, about four to eight inches uh, down. And another way to identify what we have is by their mounds. So on the left, uh, this is a picture of a gopher mound, which really looks like a fan or a crescent shape. And this is actually a very good picture because you can see the plug. You can see that plug on the left side. And then on the right is a mole mound. And it literally does look like a little volcano or perfectly shaped mound. So this is gonna help us identify what we have going on in the garden. And gophers, uh, the best way to manage them is with prevention. Okay, we might not have gophers right now, but if our neighbors have gophers, we have to understand that we could very well have gophers very soon. So it is advised to always plant our plants in gopher baskets or quarter um, or half inch hardware cloth. That's a galvanized uh, material that we can make baskets out out of, or we can line our raised beds with that half inch hardware cloth. This is going to be a protector barrier that allows the roots of our plants to grow, but it's going to prevent those rodents from eating the uh, main section of that plant root structure. Uh, something else I can share is that there is a very effective uh, repellents on the market with the active ingredient of castor oil. So please look and see that castor oil is the active ingredient, such as with this product called Mole Max. There's also Gopher Mask, Matt, Gopher Max, and there are other products with uh, castor oil. It is a uh, 
a repellent that works as a temporary deterrent, but it is really important to specifically apply it in accordance to the label. And if we don't, we won't have the same success. And it is advised to apply it a few times uh, over a course of a month. So read that label to have some success and to prevent gophers from that area for a while. Gopher traps, there are lots of different types of gopher traps on the market. I mean, look at all of these. Um, this pretty much covers it. This is, uh, in fact, this is the whole selection of gopher traps that I personally have and use. So uh, you want to find the trap that is the easiest for you to set. There, some are more difficult, some are easier. Uh, you always want to tether that trap and then have it staked or attached to something because, yes, the gophers can walk off with it. Um, Trapping is not for everyone. I know it's not comfortable, but it is uh, very effective because we are able to reduce the population. So just keep that in mind. University of California, um, UCIPM uh, has a YouTube channel that has several videos on how to identify an active tunnel and how to set a variety of different type of traps. So I'm going to uh, recommend that you check that out if you'd like to learn more. Moles, uh, as I mentioned, I found I find them beneficial, but because they're eating those grubs and so forth. However, if you want to remove the, the moles, we want to remove their food source, which is removing those grubs and the other uh, beetle larvae. And we can do that with beneficial nematodes, which are microscopic worm-like organisms that will feed on those soil dwelling insects, such as those grubs. Uh, and as I mentioned, the castor oil repellents work extremely well as a temporary deterrent. So follow the instructions on the bottle or on the bag. And there are traps for moles. However, from personal experience, moles are very challenging to trap and it's not as easy um, Let's just say uh, it's just much easier to manage them by removing the food sources and increasing that health of that turf area to prevent those white grubs and by using the repellents. And is this happening to anybody? Does this look familiar? Well, the culprit is going to be our friendly raccoon. And we might also see some whorls uh, on the lawn that's actually damaged, uh, created by skunks. Um, skunks and raccoons, uh, they know winter's coming, so they're out there looking for grubs. Before those grubs sink deeper into uh, the the soil, as those soil temperatures cool, those grubs are gonna dive deeper. So this is their opportunity to get grubs before they dive deeper. However, uh, you might not have grubs uh, and you still might see this damage because uh, skunks and raccoons are pretty smart and they are going to just look, they're looking, they maybe had success a couple of years ago. So they just wanna check their spots to see if they're you know, going to have any success. So before you apply any products uh, to remove those grubs, just check and do a grub test to make sure that you have them before you make the efforts. However, to prevent the skunks and to prevent those raccoons, we can um, just put out poultry wire. Poultry wire is very inexpensive, it's lightweight, it's easy to use. And you might think, oh my gosh, but they're digging up my whole entire garden. Well, uh, typically they're going to hit one section at a time. Um, that section is usually about no larger than 10 feet by 20 feet. That might sound like it's large. However, it's very easy to lay out poultry wire over an area like that and secure the ends with either landscape pins or um, uh, weights. So that is going to be, and then we just store it by the fence or by the side of the house for the rest of the year. Um, but again, we want to remember that we are going to remove any food sources. We don't want to feed that wildlife. We don't want to train those animals that there is a reward. We want to train them that there is no reward. We want them to know that they're not going to get any treats in the form of grubs at our property. And so we can apply beneficial nematodes. These are some resources for you to purchase them at, either locally from our retailers or online. Um, beneficial nematodes are microscopic worm-like organisms that feed off of that soil-dwelling larvae. 
This is a picture of the nematodes attacking a fungus gnat larvae. So if a fungus gnat is tiny, the larvae is even tinier and those nematodes are even tinier. Yes, this is under a microscope. Uh, very effective and a, a wonderful alternative to pesticides. And then to prevent cats and squirrels, it's gonna be very similar. We're going to use some type of barrier. Uh, there are cats, gat, mats you can purchase online. I've never, or maybe at a pet store. Uh, you can also use that poultry wire to lay it on over the soil to prevent them from scratching. We can also put bird netting over uh, plants, uh, trees and so forth that squirrels might be getting to. There are repellents on the market that act as temporary deterrents such as the cat scram and the critter ritter. Um, However, those barriers are going to be more effective, but really the big takeaway here is we want to do what we can to not feed feral cats and wildlife because this can contribute to the problem. All right, dormant sprays. So dormant sprays are traditionally used during the dormant season. Uh, we are going to apply these to plants that will lose their leaves during the winter months. And typically it's going to be fruit trees such as apples, peaches, plums, uh, or roses. These are typically the plants we apply dormant sprays to. This is not citrus, citrus are evergreen. Uh, when we apply the pesticide, it is going to be mixed at a stronger mixing rate, uh, which we are spraying directly onto the twigs and the branches of the plant. There are no leaves leaves on the plant during the time of spray. So we don't have to worry about that uh, pesticide burning the leaves because there are no leaves, but it will uh, be an excellent way to get ahead of pest, uh, early spring pests because the oil, horticultural oil that we would apply is going to smother any insect eggs or any insects that are overwintering. And then the copper fungicides are going to be applied to manage and smother any spores, any fungal spores that may be overwintering on that plant. Again, we use the oil, horticultural oil to kill insects, and we use the copper fungicide to kill the diseases. We always wanna apply in accordance to the label, and we do not wanna apply after bud break, because that means dormant season's over. So. Your past this past spring, if you had a peach or a nectarine, I'm pretty sure you probably experienced peach leaf curl. Whew, this past spring was cold and wet, and that's exactly what peach leaf curl loves. It loves cold, wet springs. So if we have a dry winter and a dry spring, our plants, our, our nectarines and peaches will less likely get affected with it. But when we have heavy rains and a cool spring, we will see peach leaf curl go crazy. So we need to apply a fungicide. There are a couple on the market. There are traditional copper fungicides, such as liquid cop and a copper soap fungicide. Um, and then there are some bio fungicides, which are on the market, which are beneficial bacteria that will colonize and reduce that uh, fungal spread, that pathogen that creates the peach leaf curl. Um, you have a choice of what you'd like to use. Of course, the biofungicides you can use more frequently. Um, the copper fungicide, you're going to apply only up to three times during the dormant season. Uh, let's just say uh, Thanksgiving, Christmas, and Valentine's Day, or the end of November, the end of December, the end of January. Any time as long as it is before bud break. Uh, these products are not intended to be used in conjunction with each other. It would be an and or or. So we're always gonna apply in accordance to the label. And we never apply a pesticide if there is a freeze, a frost, a rain, or a heat event in the forecast of 24 hours. We never apply when there is a breeze of five miles an hour or more. And if we are looking to plant a peach or a nectarine, please choose a peach or a nectarine that is resistant to peach leaf curl. It'll save you so much headache. However, if we keep those plants healthy uh, with by feeding with organic fertilizers and so forth and watering properly and giving them enough sun during the growing season, our plants will be more resilient to uh, 
uh, peach leaf curl and when other pest problems occur. All right, online resources for you to uh, 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 reference. It's going to be the Our Water, Our World website. Please check out the fact sheets at ourwaterourworld.org. And also the University of California Statewide uh, Integrated Pest Management Program. This is an amazing searchable database that we highly recommend where you can get more information on peach leaf curl and the other pests that we talked about today. Uh, Bugguide.net will help with pest or insect identification, not just pests, but good bugs too. If we're not sure what that insect is, you can uh, send a picture to bugguide.net and they will help you identify it. And then of course, when we want to learn more about the pesticides that we have, the mode of action that Charlotte mentioned and uh, different toxicity levels or unintended risks to be aware of, the National Pesticide Information Center is a wonderful, neutral, user-friendly resource. And with that, we'd like to thank you for joining us. You can, uh, we'd like to thank the Contra Costa Public Library for allowing us to provide this information for you. And we'd also like to uh, thank our sponsor, the Contra Costa Clean Water Program. Um, I'm Suzanne Bontempo. You can find me at plantharmony.org and Charlotte Hanner who's uh, started us off and you can find her at info at earthally.com. Please don't hesitate to reach out to us if you have any questions in the future. We are here to support you. And we look forward to seeing you next month for our Retain the Rain, Retain the Rain program, which will talk about all the benefits of keeping water on site and how to do that. And yes, it does relate to pest management.